Hey, this is Steve from Snow Foundry, and welcome to another installment in our Linux tutorial series. Today I'm going to show you how to install Arch Linux, which is a lean, lightweight, customizable Linux distribution with very up-to-date software. If you're an absolute Linux newbie or a beginner, go ahead and check out other things like Ubuntu Linux, because that's going to offer you a point-and-click install and uh, let you test the waters. This is for people who are looking to go deeper, uh, customize their system, and really know how the underlying fundamentals work. I'm going to walk you through the Arch Linux Beginner Guide, which is going to show you step-by-step -step how to install all of the different uh, networking things that we need to do, Wi-Fi, uh, the initial packages, etc. You can apply these steps whether it's a VM, a laptop, a desktop, uh, they should work the same, and also show you where to go if things get hairy or complex. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we'll see when we boot it up is there's a number of different choices here. We want to select boot to Arch Linux x86 underscore 64. That just means do the 64-bit version. You'll see other options there for test your memory, show your hardware information. Uh, those are all very useful things. We just don't need it to install Arch Linux. It's going to go ahead and boot and scroll by a bunch of text and everything. You don't really need to worry about anything here. If it all says green and OK, you're good to go. Remember to follow along on the Arch Linux Beginner's Guide, which is listed in the show notes. Now we need to figure out which type of system we have. There's two types, and one's called UEFI, which is the newer kind, and there's the legacy MBR. Your system could actually support both. Uh, the legacy version has been around a long time, is well documented, and is pretty easy to do. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cover that in this tutorial. But if you do have a UEFI, the Arch Wiki covers how to do it. The only difference that you'll see is, is that uh, if you use UEFI, you're going to have to partition your system differently and create a, a system partition for UEFI to use. Uh, in this case, we're going to go with legacy MBR, so now we don't need to worry about any of that. Um, so let's go ahead and figure out which disk we need to install to. What I usually do is do an FDisk-L or an LSBLK. Either one of those will show you what disks are on the system and give us a choice to figure out where we want to install to. Also, when you see me navigate the lines, sometimes I can go straight to the beginning of the line and remove the whole thing. All I do is hit the home key and then control K. It's an easy to remember shortcut and control K will delete whatever's after the point in which your cursor's at. I'm gonna go ahead and hit that now. So after this, we're going to go and type LSBLK and that's gonna show us the devices in the system. You're going to see a bunch of different entries here, and the ones you're seeing, the top one is my actual hard drive, and the rest of them are just uh, the actual live environment. So the uh, the loop devices are all not, they're all like fake file systems that we just, uh, we mount them and we access them when needed, but they're not actually on a hard disk. Uh, in this case, they're on an ISO image, but uh, it could be a USB key or whatever, and so don't worry about those other than you don't need to format those, and you can pretty much just ignore them and uh, we're gonna use SDA for our root volume. Our root volume just basically if in Windows terms means our C volume. So we're gonna go ahead and create a label. Um, that just makes sure that this actually works. If you don't have a label on there, Parted will throw some errors because it doesn't know whether to make this in uh, the GPT format or the MBR format. And so by making a label on the disk, it makes it so we can actually partition it the way we want to. And uh, you can find more instructions on the Arch Linux Beginner's Guide if you get lost here. So we're going to go ahead and make our first partition, which just is a small partition we're going to mount on slash boot, um, which again is just kind of the main drive where we're going to actually install the Linux pieces so that we can boot into a working system. And I'm going to set boot to on, and then I'm going to go ahead and make a second partition. This is what's for our root. So boot is actually going to be mounted inside of root, uh, but our root partition is going to contain all of our system binaries, so all the programs and stuff. So when I install GNOME, or uh, XChat, etc. They're all going to be installed in the root volume. Next, I'm going to have a swap volume. I don't know if I really need swap uh, too much, but it's always good to have a little bit there if you have extra space because the memory scheduler can uh, more efficiently allocate the memory. And then uh, we're going to use all of the rest of the space, and that's where you see 100%. We're going to use that for our home directory. So that way, for any additional space I had in the disk, um, I'm going to use it for home. And you, I type F disk here so that you can see. Uh, that the partitions were created correctly. You're really going to want to pay attention to the names because when we're doing these commands, you could delete data if you had a bunch of hard drives. In this case, we only have one hard drive, and I'm not, not that worried about it. But uh, we're going to go ahead and create the file system. And so the reason is, is because by creating a partition, uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to have a file system on there. So what we do is we create a file system because a partition says, I need this space, but a file system says, here's the way I'm going to lay out the data. And so it's a small distinction, but it's important. And that concept carries over into other operating systems also. 
And so you see me here, um, I'm trying to verify it again. If I type FDisk in the drive name, it's just going to bring me the FDisk editor. So quit out of that if that happens to you, and then type FDisk-L, and that will show you the drive. And so you see that I've, I see all my drives here again. And again, SDA1 is my boot. SDA2 is my root. SDA3 is my swap. And SDA4 is my home. SDA1, 2, and 4, I'm going to format with ext4, which is just the standard Linux file system I use. And for SDA3, I'm going to do an MK swap and make it a swap drive. Also, don't forget to turn your swap on by typing swap on space forward slash dev slash SDA3. That activates it for the live system. So now we're going to go ahead and mount our partitions to slash MNT, which stands for slash mount. This is just taking the partitions we created and making it so we can access it from our, our ISO or our USB key or whatever it is. And so we mount the root volume on slash mount. We mount the boot volume under slash mount slash boot. And we're going to mount the home volume under slash mount slash home. When you actually reboot into your real environment, you're going to see slash boot without the slash mount in front of it. So it's just going to be slash boot and home's just going to be slash home. This is a great way of organizing files and kind of a time-tested way uh, to manage file systems and, and much cleaner than Windows. When you see in Windows, a lot of people throw everything in C colon and uh, this is a way to be very flexible and uh, also have more control over your file system. So the next step we're going to need to do is make sure that we have network connectivity. We're going to need to download packages from the internet to install Arch. And so on this example, I actually have a DHCP Ethernet connection, uh, but you might have Wi-Fi. If you do have Wi-Fi, just type Wi-Fi menu, and that will bring up a selection where you can select your access point, enter a password, etc. And if you don't need Wi-Fi, uh, then you're probably already good to go. DHCP by default is already running, and uh, it should already have gotten an IP address and everything. We can go ahead and check the IP address by just typing IPADDR. Uh, that's the newer thing. If you if you feel comfortable with the older way, it was if config. Um, they're both the same thing. There's no difference between the commands in terms of functionality. It's just syntax. Um, so either one will work, but just make sure you have an IP address. In this case, ours is a 172.16. Whatever. Um, yours will probably be different. No big deal. And then go ahead and ping Google and just make sure that it actually worked out. In this case, we reached Google, everything was successful, and so now we're good to go ahead and install the packages. From here, I'm going to use the packstrap command. Packstrap will allow us to connect to the repositories and install all of our packages under that slash MNT, and that's where all of our petitions were mounted. And so you see when I type it, I type packstrap space the location, which is slash MMT, and then space base, and then space base dash devel. That's the basic packages we need to install. And this is all listed out on the beginner's guide if you need to reference that or cut and paste it or whatever. Um, so you see, I went ahead and I just said, yeah, go ahead and install everything to slash MNT. I've also sped this up, so it might go a little faster than your system at home. So if you watch the install, you'll see a lot of different packages being installed. And this gives you a really good feel for uh, the kind of utilities that come by default in an Arch Linux. And, and this is very similar to other distributions. And so you're going to see things like uh, Perl, so it has a scripting language built in. Shadow, that's the way uh, your password file is protected. You're going to see the Linux kernel itself, that Linux-4.1.6 is the actual kernel package. You're going to see things scroll by like GCC, which is having a, a pretty sane compiler by default. So if you want to compile programs, etc., and make them work. Uh, there's things like XFS, so other file system support. Um, it's built right in the base system, so if you had to open one of those hard drives, you'd know how to read it. Uh, there's things like tar, which allow you to package up files, kind of like a zip file. Um, and there's actually gzip, which allows you to compress them like a zip file. And so a whole bunch of great tools that come by default. Uh, thanks for dealing with USB and uh, all sorts of different things. And so you can look all these up on the Arch Wiki or in the Arch Package Repository if you need more details about what's being installed by default. And you could also remove some of them, although these are very lightweight and there's not too much reason to actually do that. So let's go ahead and take our mounted file systems and create an FS tab file. All an FS tab file is, is it tells your system, here are my file systems and here's what I want them to be called. So like in Windows, it just assumes that your drive is the C drive. In Linux, I actually tell it, hey, I want this drive to be slash dev slash SDA, which is my root. And that way um, I can change my configurations around, be very flexible. And it's all recorded right there, and it's just a text file. It's super simple, and it's standard across all Linuxes. And GenFS tab actually just takes that information from what we already mounted, so it makes it easy. I'm going to then go ahead and enter the, the truth is what it's called, and it's just our, our system that we just installed using arch-chroot, and uh, that will put me actually in our file system rather than the live system. 
and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pick a locale. Um, this is very important. If you miss this step, your desktop might not boot up. And the reason is, is because we have to pick a language, and the language allows the system to print text out in a sensible way. So there's a whole bunch of different languages out there and a whole bunch of different uh, permutations. And if you don't get that right, the system doesn't know how to talk to you in a, in a pretty sane way. And so all we're doing here is I'm just saying, hey, uh, use the United States uh, UTF-8. And then I also compiled in support for the, the other standard, which is a little more complex. And then I'm echoing this to locale slash conf. And if you used another distribution, this would all be done for you. Uh, part of the magic of Arch is, is that it's actually showing you, hey, here's how this stuff is done. And so if you need to scale this out or if your manager asked you tomorrow, hey, I need to reset the language on 5,000 systems, well, you could write a two-line shell script to pretty much do that um, and set those things. And so it's very handy to know how it's done. Uh, next, we're going to go ahead and customize our time zone. So I'm not going to explain the difference between UTC and local time too much other than to say UTC is a time without time zones pretty much. And local time is, is how you view UTC. So in my case, I'm in EST5 EDT, which just means we're five hours behind UTC. Um, my system clock is always set to UTC. UTC and then uh, we, when we read the time, so if I type like the date command or something, it's going to give it back to me in my local time, uh, which is set doing this uh, zone info file. And so I just make a symbolic link there. I use the ln-sf command, and, and I put it in slash Etsy slash local time. Uh, from here, I'm going to go ahead and make the kernel, and uh, this just makes an initial environment to boot in. So because we have all these partitions and disks and everything, uh, we need an initial kernel to boot into that because uh, by default, your motherboard and your BIOS doesn't know how to read our partitions. And so what this does is it allows um, an initial system to be set up that can actually open our partitions up that we made earlier. And in order to engage this initial system, we need something called Grub. Uh, Grub is just a bootloader, and this is for MBR, by the way, what I'm doing. And so if you needed a UEFI one, you have a couple different options that are on the Arch Wiki. Um, for our legacy kind of install, we just use Grub. And uh, it's super simple to install because all we do is install the package, install Grub on our SDA drive. And again, that's how the, your BIOS is going to know to engage Linux. And uh, from there, we're going to create a Grub configuration file. And that's literally as simple as just typing Grub-MKConfig dash o slash boot slash grub slash grub dot cfg and we used to have to configure that all by hand and now grub's super good about just kind of auto detecting your system and figuring out what's where and and if you happen to have a windows partition still grub would probably detect that and put a memory in uh, an entry in your menu automatically for you so super easy to do um really user friendly at this point compared to what it used to be and so uh, now we're going to go ahead and set our host name and so in this case i just call it my arch name for the demonstration i'm going to echo it out to slash etsy slash host name and I'm also going to edit slash etchy slash host and just put my name in there. And because it's not a real DNS name, I didn't like add it to my DNS server or anything. I just made it up, uh, you know, while we're making the video. And so when I put in my host file, what happens is, is that when I run programs, they're going to want to look at how do I find my arch name. And so this way it just instantly returns with, hey, it's your local host address. And so if you ever don't set that, sometimes you notice your system goes slower. That's why. It's because it, it skips the whole lookup process if you just put it in there. Um, now we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to enable DHCP on my reboot. So that way when I reboot, I don't have to run DHCP by hand. Uh, the live environment already has that configured. And now we're configuring it for so when we reboot into our real environment, it won't know how to do it. If you're using Wi-Fi, this won't make a lot of sense because uh, with Wi-Fi, you're probably going to use Wi-Fi menu. And Arch has a, a list of system D commands you can use to actually configure that. Um, once we get the graphical environment up and running, you're going to just do that through network manager, uh, point and click type thing, and it will remember your settings and all that. But just for the first initial reboot, I'm going to enable DHCP. Um, if you're on Wi-Fi, install the dialog package, install the uh, Wi-Fi menu package, and then when we reboot, and when I say install package, by the way, I mean just run Pac-Man space dash capital S and then the package name like this. Um, and so when you install those packages and that way we reboot, we can get on the network. So now let's go ahead and set the root password for the system. This is just your initial password. Make it whatever you're comfortable with. Um, you know, if, if you know, it can be anything you want. And it's just we're going to create a user account in our next video, so that you actually actually create your username. You've probably heard "Don't run as root." I support that. Don't run as root. Um, in this case, though, just to see if the system worked and all that, we're just going to run as root, and then we'll add a user when we reboot. Um, so I unmount everything, and that just means um, make sure that we write all the data to disks and stop using them and uh, then we reboot and so you can see that it's booting up and uh, fingers crossed it boots up correctly 
And so that means we did the partitions right, we installed the bootloader correctly, we configured grub correctly, we made initial kernel correctly, and we set the root password correctly and it lets us in. And so now we're in our system. And so uh, look forward to part two where we're going to install a full desktop environment on here. And I'll cover some tips and trips and just the things I know from, you know, using Linux for so long. So I hope you enjoyed it and uh, hear from you again soon. Thanks.